Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm very glad to have uh, around eight, 200 uh, participants joining uh, us today you know, for this webinar to be delivered by Professor Lau. Uh, my name is Daryl Ho. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Hong Kong Academy of Finance, or the AOF, in short. Allow me to briefly introduce uh, the Academy, especially for our new AOF members, as well as our friends and guests who are not very familiar with this organization. The Academy was established in the middle of last year with the full collaboration amongst the HKMA, the SFC, the Insurance Authority and the MPFA. Our mission is to serve as the center of excellence for developing financial leadership and also a repository of knowledge in monetary and financial research, including applied research. Our webinar today is in fact part of our leadership development program and I hope you know, we all can benefit from the insights of Professor Lau. Now, back to our webinar, it is indeed our great honor to have Professor Lau to speak for us today. Professor Lau is the Ralph and Claire Landau Professor of Economics of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He specializes in economic development, economic growth, and the economies of East Asia, including China. Professor Lau is a world-class economic scholar. He publishes a lot in some of the top-notch world-class economic journals. In his recent paper, The Impacts of the Trade War and the COVID-19 Epidemic on China-US Economic Relations, he made this remark. The economic, technological, and geopolitical competition between China and the US can be assumed to be an ongoing and long-term one. And it is the new normal for the next decade or two. I would highly encourage you to read this uh, paper uh, if you haven't done so. But today, you know, we are very glad to have Professor Lau to speak to us uh, on this particular very important topic at this juncture. Um, before I pass the floor to Professor Lau, may I briefly introduce some logistic matter. Uh, the webinar, including the Q&A Q sessions, will be recorded and uploaded to our website afterwards. Professor Lau will first give a lecture of about 45 minutes, which will be followed by a 15 minutes Q&A session. Without further ado, may I invite our distinguished speaker, Professor Lawrence Lau, to share his insights on the impacts of the trade war and the COVID-19 epidemic on China-US economic relations. Professor Lau, please. Um. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, it is an honor as well as a pleasure to be able to present this lecture to you today. Um, I will actually post my uh, PowerPoint on my web page in a couple of days, so you're welcome uh, to download. Um, the uh, China-US trade war actually started in January 2018, even though the first tariffs did not actually take effect until mid-2018. Um, for now, the trade war is still ongoing, despite an interim phase one truce. The average US tariff rate on the imports from China rose from 3.1% in January 2018 to 19.3%, almost 20% by March 2020. Most Chinese exporters actually do not have this kind of profit margin so that the new U.S. tariff rates will prove to be prohibitive for many of them. The U.S. tariffs against imports became effective in mid-2018, as I said. The rate of growth for Chinese economy declined from 6.9% in 2017 to 6.7% in 2018 and then to 6.1% in 2019, a total reduction about 0.8%. Uh, similarly, that if you look at the year-to-year -year quarterly growth rates, they also decline about 0.9%. So roughly speaking, that is the ballpark of what we can attribute to the effect of the trade war. Um, in contrast, the trade war actually only did uh, cause a very slight decline in the, U in the rate of growth of US, US GDP, and we shall see why. Um, the first hit actually was at the stock market. Okay, if you actually look at this chart, the uh, what I would like actually you to think about is the following: 
Um, if you really think about the potential damages of the tariffs on the Chinese economy, one of the first things you can think of is what is the percentage of Chinese exports of goods uh, to Chinese GDP? Okay. Now it turns out that in 2019, that percentage is about 3%. Now what does that mean? That means if you think about it, if China stops exporting to US to the US altogether, the total damage cannot be more than 3%. Yeah. Okay, because that's the export. Uh, but uh, one thing you also need to keep in mind is that the value added content of Chinese exports to the US uh, is actually not 100%, because um, many of the uh, inputs, parts, components of Chinese exports to the US actually come from overseas. Um, so what you really need to look at is the value added. Now, the value added content of Chinese exports to the US is approximately 25%. Now, that's a direct value added. Now, you may ask, OK, uh, what about the workers who work on these exports? And what about the uh, owners, the factories <laughs> on these exports? Yeah. If they lose the exports, wouldn't they consume less or invest less? That's correct. So there's a second rung effect of the, of the uh, uh, cessation of exports that would also apply in China. And then there's a third round effect, if you work it out. If you actually look at the whole thing all together, uh, that would be, roughly speaking, um, 66%. That is, for every $100 exports, uh, Chinese exports to the US, there is $66 uh, of Chinese GDP, right? So, so if you now think of the 3%, uh, the 3% share of Chinese exports to the US, and you multiply it by 66%, that gives you approximately 2%. So 2% will be the total damage to the Chinese GDP if all exports to the US are terminated. Okay, so that gives you an uh, approximate idea. Now, in practice, and in fact, um, I think roughly speaking, uh, only about half of the exports from China to the U.S. are subject to the tariffs. So if you think about it, uh, that, that would actually mean that uh, uh, it would be uh, half of 2%. So roughly speaking, you can think of the cost to the Chinese economy to be about uh, 1%. All right. So this is from the side of the U Chinese exports to the U.S., now, what about the damage on the U.S. side? Okay. Now, the United States' dependence on exports is very low. Okay. Uh, for China, exports as a percent of GDP is, roughly speaking, uh, 18%. Okay. For the U.S., it is actually only 12%. But for goods only, for the U.S., it is only 8%. So, roughly speaking, 8% of U.S. exports, uh, there's uh, eight per, uh, U.S. exports is about 8% of U.S. GDP. Now, what about U.S. exports to China specifically? Okay, if you look at goods, that is Chinese, uh, U.S. exports of goods to China, what would that include? That would include, for example, Boeing aircrafts, okay? That would count as U.S. exports. They are only altogether, U.S. exports of goods to China uh, is about half a percent of uh, U.S. GDP. Okay? So the maximum damage is about half a percent, right? Okay? But again, uh, not everything is value added. <laughs> okay? So we know that the direct value added content of U.S. exports to China is about 50%. But if you add in the second, third, fourth round effects, the total is about 88.7%. So if you multiply 88.7 to about half a percent, you get 0.44%. Okay? And if half of it is terminated, that would give you about 0.22%. Uh,
All right. So now you can see that the damage to the Chinese economy from the tariff war is actually much higher for China. Uh, you know, for China, it would be uh, one percent if half the exports are gone. For the U.S., it's 0.22 percent if half the export is gone. And this is what because China is much more dependent at this time on exports than the U.S. is. Okay, so that gives you, uh, roughly speaking, the relative damages uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, the uh, uh, trade war. All right. The second thing I like to talk about uh, is the COVID uh, uh, 19. Okay. Now it turns out that the um, China has actually managed the COVID-19 uh, epidemic much better than the U.S. Now, to give you some ideas, um, if you uh, think of um, the, uh, what happened in China, okay, um, the total number of cases is around 85,000, all right? And the total number of deaths is about uh, 4,600, somewhere around there, for the whole country with 1.4 billion population. What about for the U.S.? For the U.S., the number of cases uh, today is over 6 million, okay? Maybe about 6.5 million. And the number of deaths is 190,000. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge difference, huge difference. If we adjust for population, the number of cases in China is about 61 persons per million population. 61 per million. The number of deaths, people who die uh, from COVID-19 is 3.3 .3 per million. All right. What about for the US? The US, the infection rate, the number of cases per million person is 18,000, is more than 18,000. Okay. Yeah. And uh, probably 19,000 by now. And the number of deaths is close to 600. That gives you a sense of uh, that gives you a sense of what actually uh, is happening. Now, what about the impact on the GDP? My estimate is the following: you see, what what we the way we can measure the impact on GDP uh, is to look at a hypothetical growth rate. Let's say if there's no COVID-19, uh, what happens? Okay, and and uh, and in that case, I would say that the Chinese growth rate would be around six uh, percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, close to approximately six percent. And um, and it, and for this year, for 2020, um, my estimate is that the Chinese growth rate would be around somewhere between 3 and 4%. Yeah. Uh, my point estimate is about 3.4%, plus or minus. So you can say that the loss is maybe around 2.6 to 3% yeah. of G Chinese GDP. But for the US, um, the hypothetical growth rate in the absence of COVID would be around 3%. Mm. Okay. Now, but in fact, this year, the projection is that it will actually probably contract more than 5%, okay? So you add them together, the cost, the loss is about 8%. So it is a much bigger loss uh, for the US than for China, yeah. okay? So, so I, think that, I think that is basically uh, uh, the, the way it works out. And in terms of numbers, these are very rough numbers, we would say that Chinese GDP will, we will lose about half a trillion U.S. dollars of GDP, but for the U.S., would would probably lose 1.8 trillion <laughs> worth yeah, of huge. GDP. This is in part because U.S. GDP is much bigger. Now, to give you some idea, I think U.S. GDP today is um, at least uh, uh, one third bigger than Chinese GDP. Chinese GDP is maybe about. 14 trillion, 14, 15 trillion. U.S. GDP is about 21, 22 trillion. So uh, that is the case. Now, some of you actually might ask, why is the U.S. so anti-China these days? Okay, 
uh, I want to emphasize that the, uh, the, that the fact that the U.S. is now uh, pursuing a containment policy as opposed to an engagement policy, uh, it is actually um, a bipartisan policy. It was not just President Trump. If you remember that uh, under uh, President Obama, uh, two policies were introduced. This is, first of all, is the pivot to Asia. The second thing is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Okay? They are both initiatives that are undertaken, were undertaken in part to contain China. <laughs> now, why uh, President Donald Trump decided to abandon them, I do not know. Okay? But I want, just want to tell you that you should remember that the, uh, that the fact that the America wants to uh, contain China, wants to compete with China, that is basically a bipartisan policy, and it is not just Trump. Okay, so that, that is something to remember. Now, why is U.S. so anti-China today? Okay, I want to give you several reasons. First of all, there, it is because of the influence of the military industrial complex in the U.S. That has always been very strong. Now, military industrial complex was a term first raised by President uh, Dwight Eisenhower in the 50s. He's a Republican. And uh, when he was leaving office, he said that the military industrial complex consisting of the National Defense Establishment and the contractors and so forth are becoming too powerful. Now, what do they want? The military industrial complex actually wants to have as high a defense budget as possible. Okay, so that the military will have their new equipment and the manufacturers will have their new business. And so, um, but, but it is easiest to accomplish this if you have a hypothetical enemy, right? If you don't have an enemy, you can't really justify increasing your defense expenditures. But if you have enemy, that's fine. It used to be the hypothetical enemy, maybe even real enemy, used to be the former Soviet Union. And now, uh, former Soviet Union is no more, and China actually very unhappy, unhappily <laughs> has become the new hypothetical enemy. Second, I think there are some Americans, some in the US, who are really concerned that the US, that the China is actually making too rapid a progress. That is eventually, uh, maybe not today, but eventually, the U.S. may have to share influence and power with China. All right. Now, to give you some idea how fast China has uh, developed, in 1978, when China first decided to undertake economic reform and opening up of its economy, Chinese GDP was 5% of U.S. GDP, 5%. Okay, by, 19, 20, by 2000, by the year 2000, Chinese GDP was less than 20% of U.S. GDP. By 2019, Chinese GDP was um, 66%, more than 66% of U.S. GDP. If you really think about it, in less than 20 years, it went from 20, less than 20% to 66%, it won't take too long before uh, China would reach parity <laughs> with the US. Um, and so, um, now, so, so some people would say that, my God, we must slow China down. <laughs> we must slow China down. Okay, so this is behind, really, some of the thinking. Um, the, the third uh, group has to do with uh, are these liberals in the US. They have always been for engagement policy, but they've always been hoping that China will develop into a liberal democracy like the US. And they have been very disillusioned that this has not happened. <laughs> and fourth, you know, US businesses have actually have made a great deal of money in China. Okay. General Motors, Walmart, 
Starbucks, McDonald's, and so forth. They make a lot of money. But over the years, over the last 30, 40 years, they have accumulated many grievances. <laughs> and, uh, and for example, they dislike the fact that they had to take a joint venture partner. Um, and, uh, and they also, uh, they feel that the intellectual property rights are not being protected. Now, I have to report that uh, no longer are joint venture partners required. Okay, the China has changed the law, and I think for the last six, six years, seven years, China has actually enforced the, the, uh, the intellectual property laws quite diligently. But, you know, so these matters are good, but you have accumulated grievances, and so they are not doing much to help. And finally, uh, we have to recognize that, uh, that some Americans look down on Chinese people, but, in, but not in particular, but also on all colored people uh, with prejudice, okay? And this is not something that we can change uh, overnight. And uh, I think many of them resent the idea that uh, Chinese people have advanced so much so fast, all right? And, uh, and I have an analogy, and this is how you would feel if your housemate comes back and offers to buy your house. <laughs> you will not feel too happy, all right? So I think that's why I said, and as Daryl quoted at the beginning, that the China-US competition in economic competition, technological competition, geopolitical competition would be uh, the new normal. It will last for a while. Okay? We shouldn't think that it would actually uh, disappear. All right. Now, I have already given you, uh, looking at the, uh, the, give you estimates of the cost of the trade war to both China and the U.S., and I've also given you estimates of the COVID-19 epidemic uh, to U.S. and as well as China. Basically, the trade war will hurt China more than the U.S., okay? For China, maybe the cost is about 1% of GDP. For the U.S., it's about 0.22% of the GDP. For the COVID-19, for China, it's maybe a loss of around uh, 3% or so of GDP. For the U.S., it would be a loss of probably around 8% of GDP. So it would be, the COVID-19 would be more serious uh, for the U.S. than for China, okay? And, and I think, it is clear that China has handled the uh, uh, epidemic much better than the, uh, than the U.S. Now, I want to mention especially one thing, and that is this idea of blockading uh, Wuhan uh, and Hubei. Uh, that turned out to make a huge difference because if you look at China and the mainland, uh, ex-Hubei, that's outside Hubei, um, there are only a total of 16,000 plus or minus cases, okay? And only 122 deaths, okay? And this is, you know, mainland ex Hubei, you know, mainland outside Hubei has 1.34 billion people. <laughs> Huge. And this shows that the blockade and the lockdown has really worked, okay? I think without the blockade, of Wuhan and the lockdown of Hubei, um, China today might be like the U.S., right? And basically, this blockade has been very effective. But on the other hand, I think we also have to recognize that um, the rest of China has really helped Wuhan and Hubei to recover, okay? Um, they rushed all sorts of medical personnel from all provinces to help and they built hospitals in 10 days, right? There are two, uh, uh, Huosenshan and Leishenshan, you know, hospitals. They were completed in about 10 days each. And they've all been very helpful. And these hospitals are now closed down because um, basically the epidemic, even though it was very serious in Hubei and Wuhan, is basically over, you know. There were no new cases. There have been no new cases in Hubei uh, over perhaps the last month. Okay, and this shows that it is really important to 
uh, but I, I just want to say that the block K uh, is actually has been very important. Now, um, Hong Kong actually, I want to mention one thing about Hong Kong. Hong Kong actually has handled the first, uh, first phase very well, the first wave very well. Okay? And this is about, in Hong Kong, it's about in uh, late January or early February. In early February, there's a small wave. And then in, in about March, middle of March, there's another wave because of returnees from Europe and America. Um, there, Hong Kong has also handled that quite well. But then in late June, there's a third wave. And this wave, I think we're not quite over yet. Hopefully, we'll be over another week or so <laughs> too. But at the peak, uh, I think on the highest day, uh, there were 149 new cases. And that's very serious. And, and I think the lesson of all these COVID-19 cases basically said that it is important to identify early yeah. and then to isolate. Uh, and there to, yeah, for two reasons. One is that you identify early, it's easier to treat. If you wait, <laughs> it's much harder to treat. But the second thing is that if you're not identified early, you can infect other people. Okay? I have actually done some calculations. Basically, one unidentified patient, uh, infected person, can infect at least another uh, one person every two days. So if you discover early, uh, you know, you, you know, he, won't, he or she would not have a chance to infect another person. The problem really is that symptoms develop relatively slowly. Okay? It would take under seven days, sometimes longer than that, 14, and could be as long as 28 days before you show symptoms. And some people never show symptoms. And that's why identification is, is important. And that is part of the success of China in controlling the COVID-19 epidemic. And that is rapid uh, identification and then con contact tracing. And that really helps to limit the potential transmission. OK. Now, um, the, uh, what I now like to talk a little bit about, about is the effect of the decoupling of mm -hmm. the Chinese and US economies. See, as a result of the trade war and all the acrimony over COVID-19, like who, who caused it, who spread to whom, right? And uh, that has led to a great deal of, uh, of uh, uh, tit for tat uh, actions on both sides in addition to the tariffs, okay? Now, uh, one of the most important is that uh, many firms in China, uh, for example, Huawei, has been put on an entity list by the US. Okay, what does that mean? That means the US will not ship to Huawei, any firm on the entity list. In principle, you need to apply for approval if you want to ship something to uh, someone in entities. In practice, approvals would never be given. Okay, so, um, so for example, um, uh, Google is forbidden to supply the Android operating system to Huawei, so Huawei's cell phone can no longer use the Android system. And basically, if you think about it for a moment, this is lose-lose, both sides lose. Huawei lose, lost because Huawei will have to develop its own um, operating system. It will take time, it will take resources. But at the same time, Huawei actually has also lost not just today's sales or this year's sales. You know, once Huawei has developed its own operating system, uh, Google will have lost all sales in the future. So it's both sides lose, okay? And this is what's happening. And similarly, if you think of uh, the sale of semiconductors, okay, yes, if the US stops selling semiconductors to China, um, it would hurt uh, Chinese enterprises using US semiconductors as part of the input, okay? But that also means that US semiconductor companies would be losing huge amount of sales. Um, apparently, uh, last year, 2019, China imported 
300 billion dollars worth of semiconductors from the US, okay? So this is something that will actually cause problems for both. But I want to emphasize that uh, this is what I call a Sputnik moment for China. Uh, I think most of you are too young to know what Sputnik means. <laughs> Sputnik is the name of the former Soviet Union satellite, which uh, uh, it launched in 1957, surprising everybody, including the US. No one expected that the former Soviet Union would be able to launch a satellite. I mean, it actually beat the US to it, OK? Um, in fact, um, the, there was a space race afterwards, and the Soviet Union actually, former Soviet Union, actually sent the first uh, uh, manned spacecraft into space. Had first man in space, but they didn't quite make it to the moon. And the US won that round by landing someone on the moon. But why, the reason I said a Sputnik moment is that that actually woke up the US. As a result of the Sputnik launch, the US redoubled its investments in R&D, um, you know, uh, and, and basically committed to landing someone on the moon, and it succeeded, okay? So for China, uh, being cut off from the semiconductor supply <laughs> is a problem, okay? I'm not saying it's not a problem. It is a problem, but it's also a Sputnik moment, meaning that you cannot rely on, uh, on foreign supply now. You have to try to do something yourself, okay? So uh, I think it will take time, uh, but, but I think that uh, uh, hopefully it will actually uh, have a good ending. But I also want to emphasize that uh, the U.S. is out basically to try to destroy Huawei because Huawei's technology is advanced. <laughs> if Huawei's uh, technology is not advanced, there's no point <laughs> in uh, trying to stop Huawei. So I think, I think that actually uh, would, take, would take some time. But I think that decoupling of the supply chain will actually uh, increase costs from, on, both sides, on both sides. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the decoupling of the capital markets. Um, some of you may know that the US Senate actually passed a law saying that holding, uh, 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 holding foreign companies accountable act, okay? And, um, and what they basically means that uh, it will actually potentially mean the listing of uh, Chinese enterprises uh, on New York, okay? Now, but I want to say the following, that is, um, in fact, um, I think the impact on China is actually quite minimal, okay? Because um, the uh, U.S. market the, on these Chinese stocks actually is not very active, okay? And so as a result, um, many people are coming back anyway, okay? And, uh, and I think we will see more and more of uh, these people coming back. So in one sense, it's probably uh, a bad development for Wall Street, <laughs> but a good development for Hong Kong, <laughs> right? because they will come back and list in Hong Kong, and some of them will list in Shanghai or even Shenzhen. But to give you some idea that this is not creating a big problem uh, for China, um, we know, we look at the market capitalization of publicly listed Chinese enterprises. Um, uh, and it, I think this is 2019. Um, it's 8.7 percent in the U.S., 20 percent or so in Hong Kong, and 70 percent in uh, in China. So it's not going to have a huge impact. Okay, and uh, and so we shouldn't worry too much about it. In fact, I think people on Wall Street might really have to worry <laughs> if. Uh, uh, all these Chinese enterprises will leave. Um, educational exchanges, we know that there are about 360,000 Chinese students now attending school at various levels uh, in the United States. All right. And if you estimate 
very conservatively that each person spends about $50,000. That's about $18 billion. I'm sure they spend more than $50,000, but really doesn't matter. But it, this will be a loss to the Chinese students, but it's also a loss uh, to the U.S. Because I always claim that the U.S. has the best deal in the world because it will look at all the 18 years olds around the world you know, who are ready for college age, and the U.S. universities get to pick the best without having to foot the cost of raising them from zero to 18. So it's a good deal. So now they cannot, they will not have access uh, to Chinese <laughs> students anymore. Another potential problem is actually at the graduate level. Um, if you look at the major, the leading uni US universities, the main source of graduate students in the science and engineering fields are from China, India, and Russia, okay? <laughs> Very few Americans like to study science and engineering as a graduate student. It's just too hard. <laughs> All right. But uh, so I think this will actually uh, begin to hurt uh, the U.S. in terms of quality and quantity. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about the decoupling of the international clearing and settlement system. And um, uh, now, uh, at 2010, I want to show you this chart. Uh, before 2010, almost all Chinese trade is settled in U.S. dollars, invoiced, clear, and settled in U.S. dollars. Beginning in 2010, it begins, some of the Chinese trade begins to be settled in renminbi. It reached a peak of, uh, of about 32% in 2015. Oh, it's going very well. Then all of a sudden in 2015, because the renminbi devalue, abruptly, um, then people begin not to, to, uh, to begin to uh, uh, not to use the RMB, and you can see that the blue line uh, actually is actually gone down uh, to about uh, below 20 percent. It recently has been slowly uh, creeping back up. Okay, uh, now this is uh, Chinese trade uh, settled in RMB, the percentage of RMB. Um, but I also want you to show you this chart. This chart basically look at the share of wealth settlement by currency, okay? And this shows that uh, the very left, you have the U.S. U.S. actually, the red column means the share of wealth trade uh, in 2019. The blue column is the share of wealth settlement of international transactions in the U.S. currency. See, you, even though U.S. only accounts for 11 percent or so of world trade, it accounts for 40 percent of world settlement. Okay, and that means there are many third countries trading. Uh, they don't trust each other's currency, so they would demand settlement in U.S. dollars. Okay, now uh, the second column is the euro. Now, of course, lots of people you. Uh, Eurozone is pretty large, so the red column is the share of trade occupied, uh, accounted for by Euro. Eurozone is quite large, and some countries use the Euro, but you look at the fifth, the fifth column is China. China accounts for about the same amount of world trade as the U.S., but the settlement, the use of renminbi for settlement is less than 2%, okay? Now, next to China, China is Japan. Look at JPY. Japan is interesting. Japan accounts for around a little bit less than 4% of world trade and also accounts for around 4% of settlement. Okay? So this means that China has a great deal of room to grow to use its own currency for trade settlement. Now I want to say that the, in fact, if possible, using your own currency for settlement is the best. Because if you use U.S. dollar, let's say China trace of Thailand, then it has to be converted into U.S. dollar first, and then from U.S. dollar back to uh, baht. <laughs> and there's two, two transactions. Transaction cost is higher, and also two exchange rate risks. So if you can do a direct, um, you know, either use baht or use uh, renminbi, then at least one side has no currency risk, only one side currency risk, and uh, their transaction costs would be much lower. 
Okay, so, so I think um, that is probably the direction to go. Um, I think it would take a little bit more work to get third countries to use renminbi to settle. That is, you know, Thailand and Indonesia, they trade and they use renminbi to settle instead of dollar. Okay, that will take probably a little while because renminbi, after all, is still not uh, fully convertible. Okay, um, but I think that will come. That will come. But the first thing first is to use the renminbi for uh, settlement of Chinese trade. Okay, and that would basically uh, reduce the dependence on the U.S. dollar uh, for, by China. Okay, and uh, anyway, and China has developed its own system. Now, I want to now to look at some projections. Um, anyway, uh, this is a summary of various uh, people's different uh, estimates, and my with my estimates compared to IMF. And I think I am probably not the most optimistic, but also not the most pessimistic. Uh, I, think they, I think they are really, I think are fairly, uh, they are fair uh, uh, projections. But um, one of the things I want to say, project is what happens to US and China uh, over the next decade or so. Now, one thing I want to po point is the following, I think, uh, I'm showing this chart. This chart is actually shows the rate of growth against the per capita GDP. Now, it is an empirical regularity that as the per capita GDP of country rises, the growth rate will come down. Okay? And on this chart, what I have plotted are uh, uh, the points for the, US, for the China in red, in yellow it was Japan, and blue is in the US. And you can see that on the whole, it's quite consistent with what just said. That is, as per capita GDP rises, the um, rate of growth uh, will tend to come down. All right. Now, but what I want to say is this. China is now at around $10,000 per capita. Okay. So if you look at the chart, it is still at the range in which it's capable of growing at around 6%, 6 plus percent. At least it can continue growing around 6% until it reaches 30,000 per capita. And if you look at the US, US is way over there now. It's over 60,000 per capita, and it probably will be growing at only 3%. Okay? So I want to show you this chart to justify the assumptions that I use for the projections. This are the projections for aggregate GDP going forward. And it shows that Chinese GDP will catch up with US GDP, the red line, catch up with the US GDP, the blue line, uh, in about 2030, okay? Uh, this is not cast in stone. So it could be plus two year, minus two year, but it will be around uh, 2030 or so, okay? And the justification is that China can continue to grow at a high rate because it's still at a relatively low level of per capita GDP. And, uh, and the U.S. is growing at the blue columns is 3%. Now, even then, if you look at per capita GDP, that's a huge gap. You can, you can see that uh, the red line is China, the blue line is the U.S., and even though per capita uh, aggregate GDP are about the same uh, around 2030, per capita GDP, uh, China is less than one quarter of uh, U.S. GDP. Um, I personally think that it will not be, it will not, it will take until the end of this century for Chinese per capita GDP to have a chance to catch up to uh, U.S. per capita GDP. It may never happen uh, because the U.S. actually has more natural endowment, more resources, more land, more water than China on a per capita basis. So it may never happen. But uh, this shows that per capita terms, U.S. still has a great deal of advantage. Now, okay, so that's my long-term forecast. Now, finally, uh, I want to make two more points. One is the, uh, uh, on innovation. I think China really has to work harder on innovation, but there's one thing that China has to catch up 
and that is basic research. Basic research as a percentage of gross expenditure on R&D. Um, the blue line is, is US, yellow line is Japan, uh, the red line is China. China has just, uh, I think last year, just reached 6% uh, of our, our basic research in total R&D expenditure. Uh, the US, as you can see, has been running around uh, 16, 18%. Unique basic research, even though it has no returns, perhaps not even monetary, no monetary returns, but it is a basis for making breakthroughs. Um, if you think of, think of the atomic bomb, uh, without Einstein, uh, we won't be making <laughs> atomic bombs but Einstein research is basically basic research. At the time, nobody knows it can be used for making atomic bombs. So basic research is important. Now, finally, you might be uh, uh, familiar with this, uh, this book by Professor Graham Allison of Harvard University. He wrote a book called Destined for War. Basically, he's making an uh, analogy between Greek, uh, a uh, war in Greek history between Athens and Sparta, to saying that a rising power will always go to war uh, with the existing, with the current uh, uh, power, hegemon. Um, but I think I, I, I actually differ from uh, Graham. Uh, I've known him for years. Uh, for the following, um, time is too short to give you a lengthy uh, explanation. But just think the following. If the former Soviet Union did not go to war with the US in the last century, when the former Soviet Union is out to convert the world to communism, why would China and the US go to war? Thank you very much, Professor Lau, for the very insightful lecture. Um, uh, without a doubt, you know, the uh, Sino-US economic relation is a very hot topic right now. Uh, we actually received a number of questions from the audience before the seminar and also a couple of questions also during the seminar, and they are actually surrounding the uh, U.S. politics. And indeed, you know, when we chatted, you know, before the uh, lecture started, uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, the U.S. election is something that we need to watch out for, and also um, the uh, possibility of seeing some surprises, you know, before or right after the uh, presidential election. Would you mind elaborate a little bit, you know, whether the election outcome can alter your projection about, you know, how the uh, re economic relations between the two countries may evolve, right. and also what sort of uh, surprises potentially we need to watch out for? Um, okay, that, that's a very good question. Um, the first thing I want to reiterate is the following, is that it really doesn't matter who is the new president, that is China-US competition will will take place, will continue, and that's the new normal. We must remember that, okay? Um, the, uh, the thing about election is the following, and that is, it is always easy uh, to blame someone else, okay? So Trump now is gonna blame China for the unemployment in the US, okay? Because taking away US jobs for the low wages because China is flooding the US <laughs> with low cost <laughs> light manufacturers. And even blaming China for starting the COVID-19 epidemic, okay? And this is his way of blaming someone else for a job that he didn't do well, <laughs> right? It's very typical, okay? Now, if you think about the challenger, um, uh, Mr. Biden, he has no incentive to defend China. Why should he, right? So he is probably going to be uh, bashing China just about as hard, just to, so that he cannot be accused of being soft on China, all right? So I think that uh, from the point of view, uh, uh, if you look at the U.S., I think that there is a bipartisan consensus uh, that, um, you know, that is basically anti-China. Now, so that's my first point. Now, as for the surprises, see, what I'm concerned is the following, and that is um, you can always divert attention 
from your domestic troubles by entering into a foreign adventure. Okay. So, um, so let's say in October, um, there may be a, uh, an accident in, South, in the South China Sea. All right. And that would actually allow, for example, uh, uh, the U.S. to do something. All right. And I think when you have a situation like this, it is natural for the nationals or the citizen of a country to rally behind uh, their leader. Okay. So maybe uh, this is something that will work out to the incumbent president's advantage. We don't know. Okay. Um, and so that is the October uh, uh, surprise. The November surprise would be the following. I actually don't know which way the election will come out. Um, I think actually uh, Trump's re-election still has a fairly substantial probability. Okay, it's not nowhere near zero. Okay, and so the question then is, uh, what is the outcome going to be? Um, is anyone going to challenge the outcome in courts, right? And uh, and while things are in limbo, what can happen? Right. So that is also a great deal of unknown. Okay. And I, I just hope that we can pass the next three or four months <laughs> safely. <laughs> I think by Chinese New Year time, we should all uh, breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor. I think we have uh, too many black swans in uh, 2020, so uh, we are not looking forward to uh, more of those. Um, another question that we have got from the audience is actually related to international finance. Yes. And obviously, you know, trade between the two biggest countries has resulted in you know, surpluses and deficits on the other side. And that actually caused the need for recycling the money you know, and also you know, financing the deficit by one country and investing the surplus by the other. But now, you know, if we are seeing more decoupling you know, between the two biggest trading nations, uh, what would be the impact on international finance? And in particular, you know, Hong Kong being an IFC, you know, how the position would have to be adjusted in order to continue to provide the needed international financial intermediation services around the world? Yeah, um, uh, that, that's also a very good question. I think, the, uh, I think there's one thing that I like to explain, and that is, um, even though Trump thinks that running a deficit is a bad thing for the U.S., it is actually a good thing for the U.S. <laughs> All right, people must realize this. If you think about uh, you know, a country being able to buy things just by printing money, right? Uh, you know, and the other side just accepts uh, the, the money but never uses to buy anything, or they use the money to buy bonds, which is also paper that you can print. So in some sense, you can say that the U.S. has been exporting paper <laughs> in return for real goods. And it's been doing that for the last 20 years. If you really think about it, that's a good deal. Uh, I would be very happy if there's a company in Hong Kong that would allow me to just <laughs> buy things with paper <laughs> for the next 20 years. But it's a well-kept secret because, because people kept complaining, would keep complaining that we have a deficit, we have a trade deficit, but that is actually the benefit of the dollar being used as an international uh, medium of exchange. Okay? Precisely because everybody is willing uh, to accept the dollar, uh, you know, that it gives the dollar extra power. This is called senior rich. Okay, so um, so that's the first thing to remember is that senior rich is actually important. Okay, and um, if you actually think about the U.S. Uh, balance of payment situation, it just goes through many phases of running surpluses. I mean, deficits with many countries. First of all, it's deficit with uh, Japan. <laughs> then it's deficit with Taiwan. 
than its deficit with China, and I think very soon it will be deficit with Vietnam, <laughs> right? So, so I think running a deficit is actually a good thing if you can get away with it, if other people are willing to take your currency. All right, so that's the first point. Now, I think, the, uh, I think Hong Kong can, will continue to be a international financial center um, because if you think about what international financial center needs, it's basically, um, uh, you know, first of all, it has to base on buying power, that there's wealth behind it and there are people to buy. And the buying power will come from China. China now has so much wealth. You know, I was just told that there are now more billionaires in China, US dollar billionaires in China than in the US. Okay, that's a huge buying power. And these are the people who are gonna be buy, buying stocks, buying shares on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, right? And it's no longer Americans. Americans have practically no savings, although there are American institutions, pension funds, that can conceivably be buying. But, but the wealth in China uh, is staggering. And so I think that actually will keep Hong Kong afloat for a long time. But the second thing is that I, th I see that there is a trend uh, in moving to the use of renminbi. And Hong Kong is ideally suited to do that. If you really think about it, that is something that Hong Kong really should promote and the following, is that if you are a Chinese firm, you want to raise capital, and the capital is gonna be used in China for your expansion, right? Why would you want to raise it in US dollars? Why would you want to raise it even in Hong Kong dollars, right? You want to raise it in renminbi, so you can use it right away, right? So, and there's no currency risk because, because your potential revenue would all be in renminbi. So I think actually what Hong Kong can consider, the exchange can consider, is basically allowing transactions in renminbi, right? That is, but you can have the proviso that if you buy in renminbi, you can only sell in renminbi, right? So it's a little bit like today, it's connect uh, system because that also does not require conversion, but you can do transaction. So, um, and I think thirdly, I think the uh, Greater Bay Area is actually um, a great opportunity for Hong Kong, and Hong Kong should capitalize it to help uh, enterprises within the Greater Bay Area uh, to raise money uh, from not just Chinese investors, but also from international investors. Thank you very much, Professor Lau. Uh, I know that uh, we are running out of time, but uh, we have uh, one last very quick question, uh, and that is related to the long-term growth prospects of China. Yeah. Uh, we all know that uh, the Chinese population is aging rapidly, and uh, so uh, regarding the growth, uh, long-term growth forecast that you made you know, at the end of your presentation, uh, do you think that uh, it is achievable you know, given the demographic situation in the country? No, that's a very good question. Um, in fact, the uh, uh, former Secretary of State, George Schultz, uh, actually emphasized that many times. But I think there is an intermediate term problem and there's a long-term problem, okay. Now, the long-term problem can eventually be solved by people having two children rather than one, okay. It is now actually legal to have two, right. And I've been advocating, even eliminating the, the restriction to two. Why restrict to two? Because if you restrict it to two, um, then the net reproduction rate will be less than one, right? Because some people are gonna have no children, some are gonna have one. So if you have no restriction, I doubt that people in China want large families, right? But two is reasonable, right, to have siblings. Because right now, no one in China has any idea of a cousin, an uncle, <laughs> aunt, no such thing, <laughs> right? All one child, right? So I think, but that will not so 
be in time to solve the problem. That's a long-term solution, but we should promote that. Uh, right. Short-term, actually, there's an easy solution. And because most people outside China do not realize that the working age population in China is defined differently. Okay, in most of the world is 15, is 16 to 65, right, or 64, whatever. In China, it is 16 to 60, and to 55 for women, right? Now, if you really think about it today, to force someone to retire at 55 or 60 is really a waste. <laughs> it's too early. Now, why, when were these retirement ages set? They were actually set in the early 50s. And at the time, life expectancy in China was 50 something. So that chances are you don't have to support anybody <laughs> every time. <laughs> All right. But today, life expectancy is, I think, in the mid 70s or 80s, you know, close to 80 now. So, in fact, you should actually allow these people to work. And, and that actually has some very great benefits because that means a potential retiree will have more years to beef up the, the, the retirement account, right? If you work 10 more years, that means there's 10 more years of contributions and 10 fewer years of withdrawal, right? That makes a huge difference, right? So that is one thing um, that you can do that. And you are, you are making use of people who are still uh, able to perform. You know, I'm 75. <laughs> I'm retired, already retired. But what I'm saying is that uh, what China should do today is to basically say, we'll, we'll make the retirement age 70. OK. Well, 70 is mandatory. Before that, um, if you want, after you pass 60, you said that was the deal, you sign up for, you want to opt out at 60, fine. Okay, you have the option, so your privileges, uh, your rights are not diminished. You can quit at 55, if you're a woman, you insist on quitting at 55, okay, right? So the option is to, is to opt out under the old rules, but you're not forced to, have to, to use the old rules. You are only forced out when you're 70. I think that actually, uh, will be will be okay. That would actually basically fill up the interim, the 20 years when you're trying to make more kids. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Professor Lau, for the insightful and uh, uh, answers to these questions. Um, the video will eventually be posted on the AOF website, so if you want to re, re, uh, revisit some of the points uh, made by Professor Lau, uh, you can uh, you know, take a look at our website uh, and to uh, watch some parts of the videos if you want to, or just simply read the paper you know, published by uh, Professor Lau, which is you know, a very good one. Yeah. And uh, once again, you know, let me thank Pro Professor Lau for sharing with us his insights. And, and I will post my uh, PowerPoint on my web page, so you can download my PowerPoint. Thank All you. All right, that will bring the webinar to a close. Thank you very much.